Greetings to everyone. Um, this is Hassani Pettiford. I would like to welcome you all uh, in the Audacity of Marriage group, all of you members who are listening and watching right now. Today is Thursday. This is the first Thursday of the year. And according to our schedule on Thursdays, we'll be do, we will be doing book discussion. We'll be talking about different elements of the book, The Audacity of Marriage, and dealing with the concepts and how they particularly apply to your life. So I'm excited that this is a new series that we're starting. I just want to let you know that this is exclusively for the members of the group. Now, you are free to share this, but we're trying to encourage you to share it as a way of motivating other people to come into the group so that we can have some unique conversations and discussions. And so for all of you members who have not received the book as of yet, in order to be a part of this book discussion and effectively be involved, I would encourage you to get your copy. Once again, you can go to amazon.com and you can purchase it for, I believe, $16.95, or you can download it as a Kindle on your phone or your app or, or your device, whatever the case may be, for $9.99. It is a powerful, powerful book. I, I will say that we have gotten some rave reviews from people in all walks of life, whether they are single, um, in a committed courtship, have engaged, or marriage, married. It's really something that pertains to you regardless of your relational state of affairs because it can help you in your season as you transition into your next season. And so all month long, we're going to be talking about the chapter, Marriage is a God Idea. That is chapter one. And, you know, as Daniel and I were forming this book, she would always say marriage is a God idea. Marriage is a God idea. And absolutely it is. It is not an institution that was created by man. In fact, when you're thinking about God in his system and in his order, marriage, the family, was the first institution ever created by God. The institution of the church came after the institution of the family. And oftentimes, many of us who are believers who are in church and serve in church, we put more of a focus, more of an em emphasis, and, more, and dedicate more time to ministering in the church than ministering to our family. And the Bible is very clear where we should place our priority. And so once we realize that marriage is in fact a God idea and stop going to the world for answers, stop going to the world for their conventional wisdom that typically has not worked, we can find a solution to have a phenomenal mutually beneficial relationship. Now, as you know, 50% of all marriages end in divorce, right? And so if that be the case, there's another 50% who remain together. Of those who remain together, there's an overwhelming number of them who experience what we consider emotional or social divorce. That means that over the course of time, their relationship has kind of shifted in a different direction. They've lost the connection. They've lost the intimacy. They no longer spend quality time. They're no longer interacting the way they once were. I kind of say couples go from being soulmates to role mates to roommates. And so there is a slow regression, if you will, uh, throughout the course of that relationship. And so this book is designed to help move them in the opposite direction, to go from being uh, roommates back to role mates so that they can get back to being soulmates. That's what this is all about. So in chapter one, marriage is a God idea. Uh, I want to zone in on page 23 and 20, 22 and 23. And I'm not going to be before you long. Uh, these sessions may be 10 minutes. They may be 20, just depending upon where, what we're talking about and what we're delving into. But in here, we talk about the difference between a covenant and a contract. And I think that when it comes to many people, marriage is not the final season or the final phase. You know, I talk about the four seasons of a successful relationship. Season number one being the dating season. Season number two being committed courtship. Season number three, the engagement season, the season of preparation. And season number four, marriage. Marriage ultimately should be the final frontier. Um, it should be the relationship that God is a part of, that threefold covenant that has been established, that you have for the rest of your life. Now, for many people, marriage has become a, a prison. I once heard someone say something so powerful. 
uh, when your partner stops growing, your soulmate feels like your cellmate and you in, you feel imprisoned within your marriage. And that's a reality that we do not want for couples. And that's what this book is designed to do. But much like a contract, when two people are coming together to form a binding contract, there's usually a responsibility and an obligation that all parties of the contract must fulfill. If they do not fulfill those obligations, either one of those two can end that contract and uh, uh, um, in and terminate the relationship. And I think that a lot of us, when we become frustrated in our relationships, we do the very same thing. When I don't like what you're doing or when you're not doing uh, the right thing enough, when I become frustrated and I can't take it anymore, the easy out is to go and get a divorce. I often say, listen, if divorce is something that you're considering, it should be the absolute last step, not the first. You know, when we go, go deeper into this book, we're going to talk about separation and how to have what we call a controlled separation. And a controlled separation is for the purpose of separating for a period of time, clearing your head, clearing your mind, you know, identifying what the priorities are for your relationship and figuring out how you can get back together in a harmonious um, household as one. And if those steps aren't fulfilled, and there are strict things that we do in terms of forming an agreement with those two individuals, divorce is the last option, not the first option. But just so you know, that is not the will of God for your marriage. The will of God is that you have a phenomenal relationship. And one of the ways that you do that is by shifting your perspective about what marriage is. So therefore, it is not a contract. A contract is a binding agreement that has been established by a man with another man, and there are clauses that can get you out of this agreement. Whereas a covenant was designed to be established uh, until death. Now, if you know anything about when God establishes covenants with man, you know, in the Old Testament, it really explains what that process was about. In essence, uh, there was a shedding of blood. In essence, an animal had to be killed. So when God established a relationship with man, there was an animal that was sacrificed. That animal was killed, there was a shedding of blood, and it was cut in half. And one half of the animal was placed on one side of a path, and the other half of the animal was placed on that opposite side of the path. And whoever God was establishing a covenant with, that person would walk through the bloody, bleeding path of this dead animal, establishing a covenant with God. Now, interestingly enough, marriage can be perceived as the same way. When you get married, particularly on your wedding day, you're exchanging vows to one another. So you have brought God to the wedding, even though we don't allow him to enter into our homes. That's a whole nother conversation. But we've brought God into the wedding ceremony. And before God, we're establishing a covenant with our partner and with him threefold. And the vows is the first phase of the covenant being established. The fulfillment of the covenant, in order for the covenant to be consummated, it must be done through sex. But before we even get to the sex part, now, when you show up, you must understand that the only way that a covenant can truly be established is that something has to die. When we look at what the Bible says in Hebrews 9, chapter 16 through 17, it's very powerful. It says, for where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. So who's ever establishing the covenant must die. It goes on to say, for a covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it is never in force while the one who made it lives. So what does that mean? That sounds morbid. That sounds scary. That sounds demotivating in terms of wanting to get married. Why should I want to sign up to die? Well, in essence, when people get married, they're single-minded in their nature. Uh, the reality is you've been single for most of your life. Uh, you've spent 18, possibly 19 years growing up in the household and then moving on by yourself as a single person and then transitioning into a relationship and then getting married. So the majority of your life prior to I do obviously has been single. So you've spent the majority of your life thinking as a single person, operating as a single person, and now you get married and you're still single-minded in terms of how you approach life. So there's got to be a death, if you will, 
of a particular lifestyle that is no longer consistent and congruent for a successful marriage. There's got to be a death in terms of the way that we think and perceive, right, in certain decisions that we make as a single-minded person because now we're transitioning into a different phase or season of the relationship, the marital season. And so with that comes new rules, new responsibilities, new obligations, a new way of thinking, and a new way of doing. So the things that you successfully did when you were single may not work anymore within the realm of your relationship. So there's got to be a death. Now, we're not asking you to change the core essence of who you are. God made you who you are. But there must be a shedding, if you will, a pruning of certain things that are not conducive for a healthy relationship within the confines of marriage. So think about the wedding ceremony. Once you have given your vows to one another, and you've entered into now the reception. If you ever notice, traditionally at a reception, the bride and the grooms or the, the, the party will stand at attention and usually the maid of honor and the best man will hold up swords and everybody will be in formation. And the new bride and groom walks through, if you will, uh, the swords and this narrow path. And on the left and on the right side, you have the wedding party. That is much like the covenant that is established with God and man. And so the swords at the front of this party represent the tool, the cutting tool, and something must be cut. And you're cutting covenant with each other symbolically in that process. Now, when you get to the wedding bed, you are now consummating the marriage. So the penis becomes the cutting tool. The vagina, the hymen, is what needs to be cut. So traditionally, when a man would take his penis and cut inside of the hymen or the vagina of a woman, there was a shedding of blood. That established the covenant. Now you all were officially one. And so it's important to realize that that is what the covenant is, but the covenant is a lifelong partnership and an agreement that no matter what we go through, sickness or health, rich or poor, good times or bad times, we're in this thing till the end. The reality is many of us haven't truly valued our vows because to be quite honest, we don't even know what our vows are. It is almost a part of a checkoff list in your ceremony where you're just reciting and repeating what the priest or the pastor has to say. But we've never clarified what bad times are. We never clarified what sickness is. What I mean by that is many of us say, sure, I'll stick with you. But if we haven't determined what our threshold is, the first minute we experience some type of turmoil, the first minute we get in trouble within our relationship, the first minute we spot you know, issues in the relationship that we're not willing to, to deal with, we give up, we cave in, we quit, we throw in the towel, and we say, you know what, this is just too much for me. I can't do this. I did not sign up for this. But you've got to realize that in marriage, there are seasons, and you've got to be able to weather those storms. And just as in the earth realm, we have hurricanes, we have tornadoes, uh, we have all types of severe weather conditions. Well, how do you make it through? By preparing for the seasons when they come. By preparing for the storms when they come. And I think that many of us have this mentality that once we get married, we're supposed to ride off into the sunset and it's going to be happily ever after. And that is so far from the reality. There are going to be seasons of your marriage where things are going great and you feel wonderful. And there are going to be seasons of your marriage where you feel like ring your partner's neck. Now think about it. When couples first get married and they have, they begin to have children, right? Usually that is a very hard season. There's a major adjustment process, right? Because now you're not just responsible for you. You're responsible for your partner. You're responsible for these little ones. It's very taxing financially. You're up all hours of the night. Everyone's calling upon you. There are more responsibilities and obligations in your in your mind than say benefits to the marriage and so many of us just throw on the towel because this is not what we signed up for and i think one of the problems is when we enter into marriage we don't enter in with a clear perspective many of us don't go through a proper preparation process whether we're talking about premarital or pre-engagement classes or counseling to prepare us for the realities that we may face and so when we're hit with these hardships we don't know what to do and much like a contract we want out 
much like a car that we lease, we want to trade our partner in for a better and newer model. And this type of mentality will not work. And so what I told couples time and time again is when you, not if you experience hardship, but when you experience hardship, when you deal with that, understand that it is just for a season and seasons don't last forever. But the reality is we have a tendency of prolonging our seasons. See, when crisis comes, it's not the crisis, it's how you show up to the crisis. It's how you respond to the crisis. And if you have the proper tools and if you have the proper mindset, you can shrink the length of that season as you transition into the other. So God is saying, listen, uh, when you got married, even when you got saved, nobody promised that life would be a bed of roses and every day would be a sunny day. There are going to be the same challenges that you would face prior to getting married that you had when you, when you were single. So things are going to happen, but you have to learn how to now navigate with your partner. You have to learn how to resolve certain issues, right, when they occur. You have to learn how to establish what we will call rules of engagement and core values that set the foundation for that particular marriage. Establishing a marriage that is based upon a form of government that both of you agree to and subscribe to, laws and principles that you both submit to, because at the end of the day, the key to a successful relationship are those who obey particular laws. And the reality is, if you decide to break the law, then guess what? You're subject to that law. So let me give you a perfect example of a law that if you learn to obey the law, it can work. Now, many of you have been told that the golden rule is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, generally, this is a principle that makes a whole lot of sense. And in fact, it works. But I would say, I dare say, that it works in every facet of life but a relationship. Well, what do you mean? You can't do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Why? Because if you've ever read the book, The Five Love Languages, you will realize that we all have a different language. We all experience and receive love differently. And the way that my partner receives love is different than the way that I receive love. So for instance, let's just assume that my love language are words of affirmation. So I need to be edified, I need to be encouraged, I need to be affirmed, and when I receive that, I feel loved. But my partner loves quality time. So when I take the time to sit down and watch a movie, to engage in conversation, to go out on dates, to participate in recreational companionship, my partner feels loved. But what we do, we have a tendency of loving our partners the way that we want to be loved. So if my love language is words of affirmation, I'm going to love my wife, Danielle, by complimenting her. Now, even though that's nice, I'm not speaking to her in the way that she needs for me to communicate and express love because words are nice, but they don't do it for her. She needs quality time. So if all I do is write letters and send texts and send emails and give a verbal uh, affirmation all day long, but I never spend any time with her, I'm never willing to engage in intimacy with her. She feels a lack of love. And just because she's all up under me, I'm working, I'm busy, but here she comes again, wanting to give me quality time. But she doesn't edify me. She doesn't affirm me. She doesn't show me honor as the husband in the home for all the hard work I'm doing and all the things that I'm trying to do. I don't feel loved. So in essence, when it comes to love languages, you have to learn to be bilingual, right? So you must speak your partner's love language, and that is your only focus and it is their, their responsibility to speak your love language. So you can't do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But the principle is to be selfless and to be giving in nature. And if you both commit to that principle, you both win. So there are certain particulars that you need to be aware of. And that's the purpose of us having these book discussions. That's the purpose of us delving into the chapters of this book and kind of unveiling certain truths that you may not have been aware of, or you didn't see how to 
uh, apply it in a practical way that makes sense. And that's what we're committed to doing with these particular study groups. And so what I want you to do is as we read through these chapters, I want you to read with us. So the entire month of January, we're focused on chapter one, okay? Marriage is a God idea. I want you to dig deep into that particular chapter. And as you're reading it, highlight those sections that really resonate with you. But feel free to write questions down in the book. Take notes on the book. And I want you to submit those questions to me so that we can have a great conversation where we can go a little bit deeper into the discussion so that you get not just knowledge and information, but from my heart, practical application so that you can make uh, um, an impact on your marriage. There's nothing uh, worse than knowing something and not knowing how to apply something. So knowledge is empowered, but the proper application of that knowledge is really what is empowering and will empower your relationship. And so I encourage you this month, if you don't have the book, get the book. Read chapter one, Marriage is a God Idea, and every single Thursday, we will spend 15, 20 minutes, and if we have an interactive conversation, we'll go even longer and deal with these particular topics. Please share with the group members, click, uh, th thank you. Share this, share this video with everyone you know, within the group and even outside the group, and encourage them to join this particular group. And also, let me say, Magdalene Harvey is an administrator of this group. She just posted a wonderful challenge for all wives that I want you to engage in. Right now, I believe she's on day four of honoring and respecting her husband. And she laid out very thorough guidelines and instructions on how you can be, begin to bring honor and respect back into your home. Uh, women, let me tell you something. If you truly want to love your man, love him through honor and respect. Because for us, we are very egocentric. And I don't mean that in a negative sense. But we need to be validated and affirmed. We need to feel as if you admire us. So admiration is critically important. And when you honor and respect us through your words and through your actions, we feel loved. And when men feel loved, they're willing to do anything and everything for their partner. So as challenging as it may be, as much as you want to tell your husband off when he don't do right, when he's not acting right, <laughs> this is an opportunity for you to suppress, if you will, your flesh and to grow in your relationship with God. I know you're going to be challenged, but that's the whole purpose of it. It is a challenge. And so if you commit to the challenge, I guarantee you that you will reap a harvest in your relationship. Now, uh, this is not just going to be a focus on women. There will be men challenges or husband challenges as well. And so that's why we want you to be actively engaged in the group. There's so much more to offer. I thank you for just tuning in and hearing the little bit that we had to share about the difference between a covenant and a contract. And so as I close, I want you to focus on the fact that marriage is a covenant. And no matter what hardships you're going through, no matter what challenges you, you're in currently, it is just for a season. You can overcome it, but it only happens if you learn the proper knowledge, tools, and skills, okay, in order to, be, to apply it to your situation to make a breakthrough in your marriage. That's what this is all about, breakthrough. So if you've been caught up in patterns, okay, that have lasted for a particular long time, if you're stuck in a particular season in your marriage and you want to break free, get the book today, apply the principles, get involved in this group, get what you need. Listen, if you have any questions, inbox me. Feel free to go to couplesacademy.org to find out more about our organization. Also go to the audacityofmarriage.com. You can purchase your book there or on amazon.com and send me your emails so that we know how to engage you as we continue to discuss the chapters of this book. Thank you all. Love you. Good night.